This is one of the most brutal and disturbing cases I've ever covered, though I refuse to show the crime scene photos that have been circulating the internet out of respect for the victims and family. I will tell you that they are extremely hard to look at. This was a family who only wanted to help an orphaned girl feel love and safety, but in return, their own safety was taken from them. The adoptive mother would later claim that their adopted daughter turned out to be a monster. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and you guys know how much I need to cover these adoptive and foster care videos and how much of a passion it is for me due to my background with foster children and adoptive children. And so I will leave the playlist down below if you have not watched those and not gone in depth with just the pure horrors around the entire system, whether that's for the foster children, for the adoptive children, whether that's for the foster parents, for the biological parents. It's just a messed up system all around and it needs to be spoken about, which is why I continue to do so. So I hope you guys are not bored of it. I hope you guys truly listen to these cases and understand that it goes unnoticed so often and we can't let that happen. So let's get into the story. So it was 2021 in the Philippines and the Maguad family lived in North Caraboto. This was Mr. Cruz, their father, a high school teacher, and Mrs. Lavella, who was a high school principal. And they had their two children who were 18-year-old Crizzle Gwen as well as 16-year-old Crizzle Louis. Now, I don't know if it was Louis or Louis, so we'll be going by Louis during this time. I apologize if that's incorrect. I will say that most of the articles and the, you know, news reports were in Filipino. And so I did have to just kind of try my best with all of this, but I hope I have done the case justice. So these two children were said to be honor students. They were great kids. And in July of 2021, they actually had another sibling. Their parents had adopted a little orphaned girl named Janice into their family. Now she was said to be 17 years old by 2021 and she was in need of a forever home. All the kids were said to be pretty close. You know, they were close in age. So they were filming TikToks together. They were dancing. They were laughing. They were smiling. You could see the joy and connection that they had. Five months later though, on December 10th, the three teen children were home alone and their parents were away at this point, not too far away, but they were home alone at this point. It was around 2.58 in the afternoon when their father would get a call to return home quickly. That their home had been ransacked. I couldn't find exactly who had called, but it is speculated that it was a friend of his that called and told him this, but he had been hit at his wife's school doing some repairs on the structure for her, basically getting it looking nice, but he immediately rushed back home when he got this call and arrived around 3.15 p.m. And before even entering the home, he would see a blood-soaked blanket and knife right next to the door. He began to call out for his son who did not respond and then he tried to open the front door but it was locked so he ran to the back door and found it unlocked. He would go inside calling out to his three children expecting this ransacked home and instead he saw a bloodbath. This home was a mess with broken bottles, a hammer, a baseball bat and the only thing that Cruz could focus on was the body of his 18 year old daughter Crizzle Gwen who was right outside of her bedroom door. She was covered in bruises and stab wounds and was already deceased. And the horror wouldn't end there because Cruz would find his son, Crizul Louis, right next to the front door and he too was deceased and covered in stab wounds, though he was also hogtied and gagged. When investigators arrived, Cruz was with his third child, Janice. He would tell the police that he had been screaming for Janice because he didn't see her and he was shocked when she walked out of her room with her hair wet and she was looking back at him shocked and he asked her why she wasn't coming when he was calling for everybody and she said she was taking a shower and didn't hear him. Now Janet was completely fine and she told the police that three men had broken into their home and had attacked 
Krizul first and then she ended up running to the bedroom that she stayed in and hiding under this bed to get away from them while she heard them kill Krizul Gwyn. Dana said she was quiet, she didn't move, and she thought that these three men were thieves of some sort. Now, shortly after, investigators would announce that they had identified persons of interest but were waiting for the medical examination to move forward, but it was 90% solved. Now, the medical examination actually took two days because the bodies were in such bad shape. These two had been bludgeoned with a baseball bat and repeatedly stabbed with a knife. Crystal Gwynn had been stabbed 21 times and had dried blood on her and was actually stiffened due to rigor mortis and ants had already been attracted to her body and her fists also showed signs of defense. Her body was a bit different than her brother's Crystal Louis because his blood was still fresh at this point. It was not dried and he wasn't far along in the decomposition process, but he had been stabbed 51 times. This didn't exactly match the statement made by Janice because Janice said that Krizul had been killed first and it appeared as though Krizul had. But the medical examiner determined that there had been a confrontation of some sort and that these killers were angry. Now, a special investigation task group was put in place at this point. Inside of the bedroom where Janice had hid was actually her bedroom as well as Crystal Gwen's bedroom. The two girls stayed in this room and she was said to hide under the bed during the murders. But the room was found to be a complete mess, completely ransacked or so it appeared. And if the intruders had done this, investigators wondered how they hadn't seen Janice in the process of ransacking this room. Police also believe that the killers had washed their bodies and gotten rid of their underwear and their pants after the murders due to them being soaked. And the bloodstained clothes thought to be worn by the killer or killers were found in the irrigation system. It was actually it was caught in a branch in a plastic bag. Now the Maguad parents examined the home to see what had been stolen, if this really was a robbery. But the only thing that they could find that was missing were the children's phones. This didn't appear to be a robbery and Lavella, the mother, was quite suspicious of the survivor. You see, Lavella claimed that only she and Janice knew where that hammer was that was said to be used on children. It was now on the floor covered in blood and the baseball bat that was also used was said to be in Janice's room because that's actually where her brother, Chris Louie, used to live, but he gave up the bed for her. Now, Janice was taken into the care of social services at this time, or what is called in the Philippines, the Department of Social Welfare and Development. Now, social media sleuths were all over this case from the beginning, and they believed that someone close to the victims had done this. They were immediately searching for who exactly this Janice was before she was adopted. There was an alleged photo found that had been taken about eight years prior in 2013 that was thought to be a little girl who was Janice, who was alone on a ship and a good citizen was trying to find her family, but nobody really did. And it appeared as though this little girl had gone missing for about eight years. Nobody really knew where she was. She might have been in social services, but it wasn't confirmed. And her history was quite fuzzy. The horrific finding though, was that at the same day of the murders of her adopted siblings, just two minutes after the call to her father about the fact that he needed to come home, Janice posted a Facebook status and she was crying out for help. It read, guys, help me, please. Somebody entered the house. I do not want to die yet. I'm inside the room hiding. Please help. The next two statuses said condolence to eight and boy boy who were thought to be her siblings. She said, I'm sorry, I couldn't do anything. The next one just said, help me. Now, when those sentences were actually posted, so within minutes of the murders, Crystal Gwynn's boyfriend had actually seen the statuses from Janice. He was friends with Janice and he ended up trying to call her after seeing this to see what was going on. And the boyfriend would say that he called Janice. She picked up the phone, but she didn't say anything. It was completely silent. He said that a few minutes later, they were off the phone and Janice suddenly changed her Facebook name. Now, Lavella said that around 3 p.m. that Janice had contacted her saying, Mama, please help. But when Lavella called to try to see what was going on, 
Janice wouldn't answer. But by December 14th, four days since the murders, no one had been arrested or charged and one social media user was begging for justice for them, saying that there hadn't even been media coverage. Justice for Maguad's siblings began to trend and one user said some crimes need to be viral, not so that curious people would know the gruesome details, but to get responsible people to act and do their best to achieve justice. Janice was said to start out as a person of interest and a material witness due to being at the scene of the crime, though she quickly went from sole survivor to suspect. An absolutely devastated mother, Lavella, would tell police that that very day was the first time that their new adopted daughter had called them Mama and Papa. It was then revealed a little bit more about Janice and her history, and she was not an orphan. Her biological parents were alive. They were identified as Michelle and Juanito Sibyl, who were separated, but not dead. She also had three biological siblings. Maguad parents said that they had adopted Janice because their daughter actually knew her. So Chris Gwen knew her. She told Gwen that she was at this home where these siblings were someone that she had to be the servants of and that she didn't love being there. She was tired of it. And so Gwen then begged her parents to let Janice stay with them. She wanted to make sure that she had a good home. Janice wanted to finish her studies, and so that's exactly what she was doing when she moved in with the Maguads. And the children were said to be so accepting of her, loved her like their own flesh and blood. The whole family was said to care for her so much. And in fact, Krizul, Louis, moved out of his own bed and bedroom and slept on the couch so that she could have a bed and feel more comfortable. Gwen was helping her with her schoolwork, and friends of the family said that they were always seeing how much the family showed love to all of their children, and that they nurtured them into God-fearing, intelligent children grounded with humility. But that simply wasn't enough for Janice. On December 18th, Eight days since the murders, police chief major Rilan Maman held a press conference where he announced that the killer had confessed. The girl adopted into a loving family who was thought to have nowhere else to go admitted that she had murdered her new siblings. Two days prior was when Janice had confessed and she told police that she was jealous and angry, so she murdered for attention. However, she would say that she didn't do this alone. She had the help of two other people who were thought to be minors, and one was thought to be her boyfriend. Now, the police chief told the reporters that they had her and another minor in custody with charges filed against them. However, they hadn't been said to catch her alleged boyfriend. A reward was raised for information about the other killers, and investigators hinted that the motive could have been some sort of sibling rivalry, and her fingerprints were confirmed to match those on the baseball bat. Hearing this, Cruz Maguad, the father, he admitted that Janice wasn't this sweet, adorable, innocent child that they brought into their home. He said that she was jealous and insecure and that made her very angry at her sister, Crystal Gwynn, even though she was the reason that she was adopted in the first place. Basically, Cruz said that Janice wanted to take her place and he had heard that this was Janice's personality and when she was angry with someone, she would just take that person down. He said that after hearing her confession, he believed that Janice hated their daughter because of the love they showed for her. The family admitted, though, that it was rocky from the beginning. They just didn't want to admit it at first. You see, the strange behavior started only a month in when they had $184 or 10,000 Philippine peso go missing inside of their home. It was taken from their parents' room and Janice had said, well, maybe someone came in through the window and stole it. And they all thought that was strange. And then the next day, Gwen actually found the money in Janice's backpack. It was hidden inside a lower portion of the main pocket. It was hidden very well. And she had taken the money. The parents also admitted that Janice had seemed almost obsessed with movies, specifically one called The Orphan. Now, if you know what that's about, it's very fitting to this case because this is about someone who is believed to be an orphan, but it's a bit darker than that. And Janice would show Cruz this movie, her father, and he refused to watch it because it was so dark. The Orphan isn't a warm story about a, an orphan finding a loving family and being happy. 
Now, The Orphan is about a little girl getting adopted into a family and then trying to kill all of them. It seemed as though this movie was more than just a movie to Janice, and this is thought to be her inspiration for the murders. Now, Crizzle Gwyn and Crizzle Louie were given custom gowns and tuxedos for their funerals by their parents, and the parents at this time were asking the public to stop showing the gory photos of their children from the morgue, saying that it just adds pain to their loneliness, and I can't believe that's even something that they had to ask, but it is possible to even find them on the internet today. As I said, I will not be showing them because I think that that's just disrespectful, but they are available to find, and I will say it does make you realize how gruesome these murders were. When you think of a murder, it can be a vast difference on how it actually occurred and the actual process of murder in this case is just absolutely repulsive. Now, Janice was said to be called Christine in the media for a while, which is why you might see it come up through different, you know, news articles if you do choose to research this. But her birth mother actually did an interview and was talking about the poverty that her family had experienced and it was kind of giving insight into maybe why Janice was taken from her, though again, we don't have confirmation about her past or what exactly happened there. <laughs> She was then asked about the murders and how she felt about it. Her birth mother also visited Cruz and Lavella to apologize to them about what her daughter had done. Thank you, thank you The victim's parents explained that they just didn't understand why she did this. Abi mo sis, wala jud may nagulang sa imong anak. Wala jud wala gid ko naghatag sang sang ano sa iya ha, sang pagduda. Wala ko nagtatag sa iya sang ingatugig ka sakit ang gihatag sa imong anak. Unta bisag retano sa unta wala nya lang gid atong atong ka sakit. Kung mag-ingon siya, nga wala daw labot ng tasa buiboy, nga nung hindi appeal na sa buiboy. Kung si Gwen lang yun ang plano, nga nung ginig ato, mag-iod niya. Wala man siyang sala si Gwen. Si, si Gwen Ay, kaya ang nagadepensa si, sa iha sis. Nakita man yun, di ba? Kita man yun sa mga ilang man. In the end, Christine, or Janice's mother, said that she was so thankful that the parents would face her and that she promised them that she would help them get justice and to find who is behind this. Now, this may seem like something that is only one in a million kind of thing. Unfortunately, this is something that happens with adoptive families quite a lot. It's something that they fear. You see, this case needs to be spread to bring awareness that cases like this can and do happen with foster and adoptive kids who have RAD, or Reactive Attachment Disorder. While adoption can bring so much joy and love into some families, others are left traumatized and fearing for their lives. Some are left injured or even dead, like in this case. 
there are many support boards online for these families who are dealing with rad children and have no way to escape the horror. These fostered or adopted children can pretend to attach or not pretend at all and will show you how much they dislike you. Either way, they can threaten and act upon those threats and choose violence against the family instead of love. While RAD isn't only seen in adopted, orphaned, or fostered children, it is common in that due to the break in the attachment of that bond with their biological parents than with the foster parents before they get to that forever home. This causes a huge issue with their attachment, which needs to be researched further due to this causing a child or a teenager to forcefully push away anything or anyone that resembles love and attachment. Telltale signs of this can be lying, manipulating, stealing, threats that are verbal or nonverbal, especially for young kids. They will often write the threats or even make drawings of their threats. Rages, the inability to show love or only showing love when they are wanting to get something. And much more than that, it is not just a child having a tantrum, having a bad day. Oh, all children lie sometimes. It is much deeper than that and much darker. And I really encourage you to research it further. Rat is something that I talk about often not just to regurgitate the same information, but because there is no help for it at this point for these families. There is no one willing to talk about it or even acknowledge it, especially within the foster care system, but anywhere else as well, such as psychiatrists, therapists, professionals in a school setting. Families will be begging for help, fearing for their lives, and there will be nothing done for them. In fact, therapists, school employees have been known to blame the family for the scary actions of the child while the family is clearly showing PTSD from the child's actions. It is a devastating epidemic and it's becoming worse in time, especially because there is no work being put into how we can help this, who can stop this, because at this point, no one really believes that it's possible to cure. And with the foster system deteriorating year after year, it's only going to get worse professionals, therapists, psychologists who go to school for this, they only have about a paragraph about reactive attachment disorder in all of their studies. No one is being informed, which is why I am determined to make as many people as possible informed. If we do not acknowledge RAD or the effect of broken attachment, more cases like this are going to keep occurring. And I wanted to be so loud about it in this case, especially because the McGuad parents feel the exact same way about their adopted daughter, Janice. They gave her everything. They did everything for her. And it wasn't enough to stop her from becoming a murderer. On February of 2022, the mother of the victims, Lavella, told the media that her family had actually received a copy of the court statements and were able to find out what really happened that day. And she said that the girl that they had adopted was in and out of foster care for eight years. And she also received intervention, which was not disclosive in her father files as it often isn't in their files before they adopted her. One of the other suspects was said to work at a church but was also a minor, was said to be around 16, 17, and the other one wasn't really talked about. The one thought to be her boyfriend who was never in custody at all. While editing, I located a Facebook post from Lavella where she had posted screenshots of part of the script from the interrogation of Janice. This was not ever seen before this time, and one of them showed that an officer was asking Janice if Gwen was shouting her name. And she said, no, she was not shouting. She was only saying, this is just a dream. This is just a dream. I'm still going to become a doctor. I don't know what wrong I did to you. Janice, I love you very much. And it did note that Janice was crying while saying this part. The next screenshot said that the officer had asked her what else had happened. And Janice said she told an accomplice, which is not named, that she could not take it anymore. But then he said, you idiot. These are actually good people. This plan of yours is such a failure. Lavella said that she was frustrated with how long it took to get the suspects in custody due to their age. They weren't under surveillance. Nobody was tracking them because they were minors. And she was saying that you can't underestimate kids just because they're young. Because they have the manipulative skills. They have the power to destroy other children. Good children, promising children. She even said that a social worker told her that minors who kill shouldn't be called criminals, but she said, and what do you want to call them? Santa? 
She said she feels like her head is going to explode from the pain and her and her husband are heartbroken. She was also speaking out and hoping for those in support of the Juvenile Justice and Welfare Act of 2006 in the Philippines those supporters would open their eyes to reality is what she is hoping because under that act perpetrators won't be held accountable by law if they're under 15 and children who are over 15 but still children won't be sentenced to jail but sentenced to a rehabilitation center she says that youngsters who are already in that state of mind where they can murder someone are being safeguarded at that point now in may of 2022 the regional trial court would sentence the killers the mcguad parents attended and lavella actually screamed at janice what kind of girl are you you are not human she said that she was restless and sleepless for weeks and doesn't even know how to feel now that she's getting a sentence judge alexander batoya sentenced a now 18 year old janice to 30 years in jail 18 years minimum 32 years maximum without the possibility of parole and the 17 year old boy the one involved with the church and thought to be an accomplice here was sentenced to a minimum of 12 years and a max of 37 years without the possibility of parole as well. Now, because they were minors at the time of the crime, they will remain in custody of social services and kept in a safe house until they reach 21 years of age, as far as I could tell. Basically due to the Supreme Court rules on children in conflict with the law, that they will start serving their sentence only when they are 21 years old. So it's not like they're getting away with it, but it's just getting postponed until they're an adult. But Cruz and Lavella said that this decision won't heal them, that they saw no remorse from Janice in that courtroom and that the kindness that she had showed them was scripted. Janice didn't ask for forgiveness. She didn't acknowledge any regret and she even smiled at them. They said those criminals are really monsters. They stabbed the bodies of our innocent children. No normal person could do that. Only demons and monsters could do that. I was unable to find the name of the accomplice who was sentenced, nor the alleged third accomplice who was never believed to be charged. And I want to ask you, do you think that they were actually involved in this murder? I mean, due to the sheer volume of stabs and the just gruesome way that their bodies were found. It does seem like maybe this was more than one person. However, this could have been a very angry person that Janice appeared to be that had done this. So I just don't understand why this third person was never caught. Janice specifically said that there was two other people who helped her. I'm just not sure we can believe everything that this girl says. I really wish that there was more I could tell you about her history and what happened during those eight years, but I'm really not sure. From what I could find, especially when the translated articles or articles that I translated myself, there wasn't really much on it. It seems like nobody wants to talk about what happened during those eight years, and that just may be it. Maybe they didn't know where she was. Maybe she was running from home to home. Maybe she went back to her biological family for a while. That doesn't excuse her for what she did to her those adoptive siblings that were the ones who helped her to begin with. But in a time where children are becoming criminals faster and faster, something needs to be done. But what exactly is the answer here? Of course, the answer is spreading awareness and being knowledgeable about it. But is there a way to slow it? to stop it. Please, please research into RAD and into the foster care and adopted systems that are in place around your area and how you can help make it better. And that's the thing, it's very hard to find ways to help or make it better because it is a very silenced system that doesn't want you to know how bad it really is. But when you are in it, in the thick of it, there is nothing that could ever make you think that it's going to get better or that it isn't horrible because you understand. So yeah, don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.